aren't the best and uh, a little slippery in places. Thank you for braving the weather. And uh, for those of you that are at home viewing, thank you for joining us. Then you don't have to deal with the slippery road. Um, announcements to share. Of course, we've got the trunk or treat coming up next uh, Saturday. So please remember that. And if you want to be a part of it, come on over with your car, pull it in, open the trunk, decorate it, or not, 
and uh, bring some Halloween candy to hand out. We'll be here from 5 to 7 or until people run out of candy. And uh, we'll also have some hot chocolate on for the kids to warm them up a little bit because it looks like we'll need to warm people up a little bit that night. Um, we're going to be meeting after church for confirmation and getting started with that. Uh, we've got coming up, uh, the first, of course, is daylight savings time. Already time to fall back, lose an hour of sleep, and all of that kind of stuff on uh, going into the first. What? You get an extra hour of sleep. What? I do? You Oh, good. I like that one then. Okay. As, as much as you can like the change of time. Yeah. All right, I'll live with that. we got two meetings coming up on the Wednesday, the 4th. The Christian Ed and the Administrative Board are scheduled, so uh, keep track of those. got uh, a note from the food pantry. They were very, very thrilled about the receiving the cookies that they did get, and uh, they're very thankful. They also asked if we'd be willing to collect peanut butter, snack items, and cookies that's an area that they're really seeing a shortage in, so give that some thought, think about helping out. And um, if you hadn't noticed, the auction items are out, and the auction uh, is actually online now. If you want to bid, you go to schultzauctions.highbid.com and just scroll down. There's two others before us, but we're down there in the bottom list. And you can sign in, register to bid, and then you can bid on all of the items for the, for the annual Fall Bazaar auction. Saving Jeffrey his voice so he doesn't have to be auctioneer. Uh, but they're hoping to have you back next year, so don't, don't give up your, auction, uh, your auctioneer skills. They don't know about the uh, I, I don't think Where that's possible. <laughs> And when that fails, threatening, you know, <laughs> cajoling, <laughs> embarrassing. Well, you know what? He, he might not. He might not like to do that, but he always seems to have a good time when he does. But maybe that's just because he has a good time doing whatever he has to do. There is well, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> anyway, so be sure to uh, get on there and check out the auction items. You can go out and wander through. There's a lot of really nice stuff, again, as always. And uh, make sure you go on and bid uh, early and often and high. <laughs> because they're not making any money from the meal this year. So it's all auction. Which is normally where most of the income is anyway. So just make sure you take a look at the items and, and place a bid and uh, be generous in your bidding. If you have any problems or questions, um, Lisa or I can help you probably, and um, I don't have Mark's number on there, but his phone number is also listed, but it's pretty foolproof. I can do it, nearly anybody can, so. Anyway, um, do we have any other announcements we need to share? We're still doing the diaper drive. Oh, and we've got a new box in the back. Um, a lot of you know Deb Schultz. Uh, Deb Schultz says, got a mission on her heart that she's been working on on her own for the last year or two. And it's uh, called M's Gifts. It's gifts of, of gloves or mittens, good, nice heavy duty ones, scarves and hats for homeless people and people in need. And uh, her goal this year is to distribute 250 of those packages. She bought 250 hats last year when I think it was Menards had a closeout sale. She went and bought everything they had. And uh, she, she's looking for another 100 scarves and 100 gloves or mittens. Nice, heavy duty, uh, not the dollar store ones, but the really good ones. The kind that you'd buy to keep your hands warm when you're out working or you're out in the, out in the yard. So if you can do that, we have a box in the back. Uh, if you're not a big shopper, you can also just donate something to help pay for some of those things. So uh, if you would. Just consider that. Yeah, Ray. Senior youth are selling wreaths. Um, they're not going to go door to door. Um, so if you know somebody, you can call them, send them a message, or one of them sitting back here in the back. Um, the other thing is, next month we would normally do our scavenger hunt, and we're not going to do the scavenger hunt this year. We're going to set up a table in the back in the fellowship hall because um, there's still a need for that kind of stuff. 
uh, mm -hmm. more than the food pantries and stuff. Yeah. Um, there'll actually be a box there too. If you don't want to bring food, you can drop a little bit in the box and all that will get sent up to the food pantry. Yeah. And we'll probably have that by next week. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so lots of opportunities to give and to share. And uh, I hope that you avail yourself of one or all of them. A good way to help out by, by giving back to God's people. Other announcements? We're going to turn to a PPR meeting next Sunday. Okay. So PPR will meet next, what, the first? Yeah. Right after church, basically. Yeah. Okay. Well, before we do our birthdays and anniversaries, I know that uh, Sherry's got something from UMW. Lisa would have been here, but she pawned it off on Sherry. So Lisa, as UMW president, would be giving out this award, but she's going to be here today, so I'm reading what she wrote up. Each year, the United Methodist Women pick a recipient for special mission recognition. <coughs> this year's recipient has shared her gift for the ministries of our church with our adults, youth, and children. She's always willing to step up and help when there's a need, whether it is to teach Sunday school, read scripture, share special music, direct the Christmas program, or even undertaking the position of vacation Bible school director. She's been a huge part of implementing our weekly church service virtually for everyone to enjoy. When there's a will or a way, she puts forth the effort with patience as she accomplishes it. Our Hitchcock United Methodist Women are proud to present this year's special mission recognition recipient, Hazel Barrons. going to type in the name of the recipient. There you go. <laughs> you know how to spell it. <laughs> get, that, get that taken care of. <laughs> Thank you very much. You could tell she wasn't really listening closely because if you listen, especially the vacation Bible school director should have given it away. But she had a cheap. I wasn't, I'm not going to say anything about how she pays attention. Because <laughs> I'm as guilty on the other side, so <laughs> not going to go there. Do we have birthdays or anniversaries, Zane? <laughs> he isn't going to get to deny it, I know that. So, especially he's got his sons here, his wife, and all of his friends. They're going to make sure. Yeah, Zane's got a birthday. Anybody else got one close or coming up? Just... Who? Courtney. And Courtney. Courtney's. Landon is on Halloween and Courtney's on the 29th. So we'll, <laughs> we'll be past it by the time they that comes around next week. So yeah. So Courtney and Landon and Zane. My younger brother's actually All right. So we got a few birthdays. Let's sing a little happy birthday then.
think about coming into your presence, and yet you welcome us in. You're excited to see us, Lord, and we are excited to be in this place with you. And whether we're here in person or here online, we know, Lord, that you're with us. So be with us today as we worship. Let our words, our thoughts, our meditations, and all that we do be pleasing in your sight. We pray that today in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Our opening song is a Good old Fanny Crosby tune to God be the glory. <clears throat> Can't pop. 
it's too heavy. Now it just, I gotta have to jump on it. <laughs> and put it on the floor, right, Lisa? Isn't that what you told me? Bubble wrap on the floor? She was telling me about their Halloween decorations one year. They put this on the floor and make it really creepy, and apparently it, pretty, it was pretty creepy. Yeah, so bubble wrap. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. I don't know whoever invented it. I hope they made a lot of money from it, because it's a, a thing that, I don't know whoever, you know, how would you think of this? But it's handy, right? You can wrap stuff up in it, and it keeps it pretty safe. I mean, you know, assuming that the UPS driver doesn't jump up and down on the box or something, stuff will come pretty safe. It keeps things protected. It keeps things from getting broken or damaged. Good stuff. And, you know, it's pretty a pretty simple concept. Just a little bit of air and plastic. Nothing fancy. And, you know, in a lot of ways, God is kind of like this bubble wrap for us. Now, he's not all full of air and plastic, but he protects us. He keeps us safe. Um, you know, and, and actually he talks about you know, putting his arms around us, putting his hands around us to keep us safe. Kind of like this. When we're in God's hands, we're in God's arms. Stuff can hit us. And I mean, you still get bounced around and you still feel it, but you don't get damaged. You don't get broken. And that's a good thing because there's a lot of stuff that bangs us around and knocks us around and they have God surrounding us with protection. Just like a big, big thing of bubble wrap to keep us safe from all of the stuff that would mess our lives up. That's a pretty cool idea and I'm glad he does it because I, you know, even with the bubble wrap of God's arms around, I still get a few bumps and bruises from, from things in the world and it's nice to know that he's there to protect Thank you so much, God, for surrounding us with your love and your protection every day. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, it's kind of like bubble wrap because it keeps us safe. But also it's, it's better because it's your arms. It's not just plastic and air. It's you that surrounds us. It's you that loves us. It's you that keeps us safe. And we're so grateful for that. Thank you, Lord, for surrounding us with your love always and every day. Maddie, are you going to do the bag next week since you're the only other one here? And Kobe made Cooper take it last week. He was so mean. Yeah. Oh, here. Give me back the bubble wrap. You probably need something. today is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Reading from the New Inter International Version, which Steve keeps telling me is like his favorite right now. So I don't know if it'll always stay that way, but it's been that way for quite a while. So from e the book of Ephesians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the way that he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, 
having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So we're going to be <clears throat> starting on a series uh, based around the book of Ephesians. And uh, as I've done occasionally in the past, I've got a, one of my the videos that we have from a group called Bible Project. And this is uh, an overview of the book of Ephesians. So if you want to just watch that as Ray runs it and uh, enjoy the, the overview. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus is really interesting. You can go read about it in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was a huge city. It was the epicenter of worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had a really effective missionary presence there, and lots of people became followers of Jesus. Years later, after being imprisoned by the Romans, Paul wrote this letter. The movement of thought in the letter divides into two really clear halves. In the first half, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel how all history came to its climax in Jesus and in his creation of this multi-ethnic community of his followers. The second half of the letter is linked to the first by the word, therefore. And here Paul explores how the gospel story should affect how we live every part of our life story, personally, in our neighborhoods and communities, and in our families. So let's dive in, and we can see how Paul develops all of this. Chapter 1 opens with a beautiful Jewish-style poem where Paul praises God the Father for the amazing things that he has done in Christ Jesus. From eternity past, the Father has purposed to choose and bless a covenant people. And think here, the family of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And through Jesus now, anyone can be adopted into that family. Jesus' death covers our worst sins, our worst failures, and in Jesus we find God's grace. In fact, Paul says, that grace has opened up a whole new way for us to understand every part of our lives. He says in chapter 1, verse 10, that God's purpose was to unify all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, which is a title that means Messiah. God's plan was always to have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus the Messiah. This divine purpose became clear, Paul says, when we were first made into that family. And here he's referring to ethnic Jews in the family of Abraham. But then Paul talks about how you, and here he means non-Jews, you all heard about Jesus and the salvation through him. And you were also brought into this family by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so here he's referring to the events told in the stories of Acts, about how God's Spirit brought together Jew and non-Jew into one family in Jesus. It's just like God promised to Abraham Notice also how in this poem, Paul begins by talking about God the Father, but then about Jesus the Son, and then here at the end about the Spirit. All three work together as Paul tells the story of the Gospel. It's really cool. After the poem, Paul responds with a prayer. He prays that these followers of Jesus would not just know about, but personally experience the power of the Gospel. That they would be energized by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and placed him as the exalted head of the whole world. Now, in chapter 2, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key ideas from the poem in chapter 1, especially God's grace and this new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. He begins by retelling the story of how these non-Jewish Christians came to know Jesus. Before hearing about Jesus, they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were trapped in a purposeless life of selfishness and sin, and they were deceived by dark spiritual forces of evil. But amazingly, God, in his great love and mercy, he saved them, he forgave all of their sins, and he joined their lives to Jesus' resurrection life, and he's brought them back to life too. And so now, 
having been created as new human beings through Jesus, they have the joy of discovering all of the new calling and purposes and tasks that God has set before them. Not only have they been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. Before hearing about Jesus, these non-Jewish people, they were not just cut off from God, they were cut off from his covenant people, the family of Abraham. And for a really practical reason, the commands of the Sinai covenant, they formed like a boundary line around the family. They were like a barrier that kept most non-Jewish people away. But in Jesus, the laws of the Torah have been fulfilled, and the barrier is removed. The two ethnic groups have become, as Paul puts it, a new unified humanity that can live together in peace. So Paul goes on in chapter 3 to marvel at the unique role that he got to have in spreading this good news to non-Jewish people. And even though he's in prison, he's thanking God for the chance he's had to see this covenant family grow so huge. So Paul closes the first half of the letter with another prayer. This time, he prays that Jesus' followers would be strengthened by God's Spirit to simply love that Christ has for his people. The second half, and he starts challenging the reader to respond to the gospel story by how they live their own life story. So he starts in chapter 4 with just the everyday life of the church. The church is a big family with lots of different kinds of people, but he emphasizes that they are one, and one is a key word in this chapter. They are one body that's unified by one spirit. They have one Lord with one faith. They have one baptism. They believe in one God. That's a lot of unity. However, Paul says, unity is not the same thing as uniformity. He goes on to explore how Jesus' new family consists of lots of very, very different kinds of people. But they're all empowered by the one Holy Spirit, each using their unique talents and passions to serve and to love each other and to build up the church. And here he uses two really cool metaphors. One is building up the church as a new temple. And the second is that they are all becoming a new humanity with Jesus as the head. And this new humanity is a metaphor he's going to then run with for the next couple chapters. Paul challenges every Christian to take off their old humanity, like a set of old clothes, and to put on their new humanity, in which the image of God is being restored. And he then goes on into this long section where he compares this new and old humanity. So instead of lying, new humans speak truth. Instead of harboring anger, they peacefully resolve their conflict. Instead of stealing, new humans are generous. Instead of gossiping, they encourage people with their words. Instead of getting revenge, new humans forgive. Instead of gratifying every sexual impulse, new humans cultivate self-control of their bodily desires. Instead of getting drunk, new humans come under the influence of God's Spirit. And he spells out what that influence looks like in four different ways. The first two have to do with singing. Singing together, but also singing alone. And this is really interesting, but the first thing that Paul thinks of about how the Spirit works in the lives of Jesus' people is singing and music. The third sign of the Spirit's influence is being thankful for everything. And the fourth is that the Spirit will compel Jesus' followers to put themselves underneath others and to elevate others as more important than themselves. And Paul actually expands on this fourth point by showing how it works in Christian marriage. So you have a wife who follows Jesus. She is called to respect and to allow her husband to become responsible for and the husband is called to love his wife and to use his responsibility to lay down his selfish agenda and to prioritize his wife's well-being above his own. And Paul says it's this kind of marriage that's actually reenacting the gospel story. The husband's actions mimic Jesus and his love and his self-sacrifice. The wife's actions mimic the church, which allows Jesus to love her and to make her new. Paul then applies the same idea to children and parents as well as slaves and masters. Paul closes out the letter by reminding these Christians of the reality of spiritual evil. These are beings and forces that will try to undermine the unity of Jesus' people and to compromise their new humanity. And so Paul challenges them to stand firm and to put on this metaphorical set of body armor, which he describes in detail. And Paul has drawn all of these pieces of body armor from the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah depicted the Messianic king. And so now, as the Messiah's followers, we need to make the Messiah's attributes our own since we make up Jesus' body. Practically, I think Paul means for Christians 
to begin to form habits, <coughs> proactively using prayer and the scriptures and our relationships with each other to help us grow and mature as followers of Jesus. And that's the letter to the Ephesians. It's very powerful. It's where Paul summarizes the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story. All right. The book of Ephesians, as it shares and talks to us about becoming who we are. So I'm going to get this thing fired up. Oh, no, it's going too fast. I'm skipping through all of it. There you go. Who do you think you are? That's what I've titled this series. I told Hazel that I was thinking about that, and then I went back to the to the 60s and the 70s. Janet King, Mr. Big Stuff, who do you think you are? I'm old, so I remember watching that on Soul Train, so that's how old I am. And I decided not to use that as the theme music for this <laughs> series. But that's the, that's the idea of the book of Ephesians. It's helping us as followers of Christ, as the people of God, to know who we are. Who do we think we are? The book of Ephesians is going to help us understand that and help us to kind of get that you know, in our heads and get our heads around that. Now, the book of Ephesians is, is an interesting, interesting book. Um, there's... Even though it, to me, seems so personal and so from Paul, there's a huge uh, group of scholars that don't believe Paul wrote it. Not that it's not right, not that it's not like what Paul would have written, but they don't think he wrote it, they think somebody else wrote it. Well, I'm not going to go into that. That doesn't matter to me because it doesn't change the message. Whoever wrote it, whether it was Paul or one of his disciples, they, they understood how Paul thought and they... I think, captured who he was. But it's about finding our true identity. You know, we, we all, we all want to know who we are. I, um, as I was researching this, I ran across, and I had forgotten about this program. There's also a TV show called Who Do You Think You Are? And that's where they go and find famous people, and then they research their, their ancestry. And I told Hazel that, and she kind of laughed, and they said, well, yeah, obviously they pick famous people because nobody cares about my ancestry except me, and that wouldn't make much of a TV show. So they go back and they look and they, they search back. Well, the writer of this book doesn't go back, you know, into the ancient history other than to remind us that we're part of an ancient story. But he goes back to the time when we changed, when we became somebody else, when we were chosen by God. And, and to me, as I read this little recap, it was a, a bit of a prayer and a, just a reminder, that's what kept coming back to me. We're chosen by God. And so I think that's a great place to start when we're trying to figure out who we are. The first thing we need to know is that we are chosen God, not just, you know, not just to, um, you know, be his son or to be his daughter, but we're chosen, and that's always been his plan. That's one of those things that's kind of, you know, it's kind of weird to understand that God has always planned on choosing us even before we were around. God always intended to choose and to bring us into the family or at least give us that opportunity. God's not going to force us into the family. He'll let us decide to join, but he won't quit asking. He won't quit bringing us towards that. And it's through this part of the being part of that family that we find out who we are, what we're living for. And it's through Christ. And that's really the the, the crux of this whole little first chapter and, and the part that, uh, that Hazel read for you today is it's about, you know, understanding that we were chosen in Christ and through Christ and through Christ we're going to find out who we are. So we have a secret identity? Well, probably not. I was going to use the Superman from back when I remember the black and white one. 
but I figured nobody would understand who the guy was that was next to him. <laughs> but we have that, that identity. We, we have a, an identity, and for some of us, it is a secret. It's some of us, we don't, we don't want people to know that we have that identity. But in Christ and through Christ, we need to let our identity be seen. We don't need to keep it secret anymore. We should not keep our identity a secret. We are chosen. We are adopted into the family of God. You know, as I was reading through this, I, I went back and I was, I was looking at uh, some concepts in Roman law. In Roman law, uh, a son was under his father's authority until the father was no longer around. The father could have the son put to death. He could have the son work for no wages. He could do anything he wanted with his son. That was his right. No matter how old the son was, the father always had that authority. But it's interesting when they, you know, maybe their son was a disappointment or they didn't have any sons, they could adopt someone. And when they adopted someone, that person that was adopted actually took priority over their natural born children. They would be the first in line for the inheritance. They would be the first in line for everything. And, and I, you know, I think that's part of the reason that Paul used those words. He, in Greek, the words he used meant receiving Roman citizenship, sonship, as a son of God. Giving the Gentiles, in many ways, priority over the natural born Jewish children. But part of that was just to say, you're not second class. You're not less important because you weren't born into this chosen line of Jewish people. You're as important and maybe more so than what they were. And so we are now part of the family of God. And it's a, as, as he, as the writer in that last little piece said, you know, we're, we're unified as the family of God, but we're not uniform. We're different. We look different, we think different, we speak different languages, we live in different places, we eat different foods, you know, we have different colored skins, we believe things differently than others do, but we're all part of this one huge family that's God's family. And when it gets down to it, how do we live? You know, how do you live? I don't know if anybody in your family has ever told you, well, you're a so-and-so, and this is how we believe, or this is how we act. And there's some of that in every family. You know, every family has the, this is the family trait. Now, some of them are not good, and some of them are great, but we all have that. And in God's family, we also have family traits. And I think the most important one is the one that Jesus talked about when he said, if you want to follow me, if you want to be like me, if you want to be a part of the family, this is what you do. You love God and you love other people. And so in the book of Ephesians, that's kind of what we're being told to do. We're being told to live as chosen people, as a part of the family of God, and to live the way God's family would live. And that's to love God and to love other people the same way we love ourselves. There's also, we can throw in there, to love ourselves and love other people as we love ourselves. Uh, because that's important too, being able to love yourself. So this is how members of the family of God live. So who do you think you are? Well, to begin with, we're members of the family of God, chosen sons and daughters of God. And we need to live in that way. We are chosen. We're dearly loved. We're all children of God. And that's where I'll stop for today as we think about that. Next week we'll, we'll slide into the, uh, the second chapter and see what else we need to learn about who we are and what difference it can make in our lives. But until then, remember, you are chosen and you're a dearly loved child of God. Amen. And amen.
So, time for us to respond to God's word and to look at our prayer concerns. Um, you see the prayer concerns listed there. Um, I did add one, and no, I must not have got it to you, the change there. Uh, we want to add Julie Miller onto our prayer list also. She's uh, going to be having uh, surgery for breast cancer on Monday. And so we want to be lifting her and her family in prayers as she goes through that. Um, just surround her with your thoughts and prayers at this time. Um, and, and of course the others that we have listed there that we've been praying for, for the families that have lost loved ones. We want to keep praying for them. Um, you know, grieving doesn't have a, a schedule. And, uh, and some folks, even though the, the passing has been quite some time ago, are still going through that. And so we want to keep lifting them up in prayer. We also want to lift up in prayer all of the folks in the, uh, in the medical community, uh, those that are working with physical health, those that are working with mental health, for all of the folks in the hospitals, the nursing homes, for the uh, emergency workers, our EMTs and first responders and firemen, and, um, and our armed forces, our law enforcement, um, our church and world leaders, and our nation. We need to be in prayer for our nation in this time. Uh, also want you to uh, lift up in prayer a friend of mine. Uh, I know I told you a couple of weeks, a couple of times back about one of my pastor friends that developed COVID. Another one has um, a pastor up in Kandu, Rala, and Rock Lake, which is kind of on the Canadian border almost. Um, wonderful guy, fabulous photographer, wildlife photographer. Finished a wedding Saturday and uh, got home and ended up going by ambulance to the emergency room and he's diagnosed with COVID and so we don't know where to go from here. This just all happened Saturday. He had to, he was embarrassed. He had to cancel church <laughs> on Sunday. And I'm sure his folks, that's the least of their concerns. So uh, very dedicated young guy. Well, young guy, young compared to me. Anyhow, his name is Rick Craig. Uh, he's just a, a great guy. So keep him in prayer and, and his family as they deal with all of the things that are going on with that. Um, I also have one pastor friend in Bismarck who's just coming out of quarantine after she was exposed to COVID and had a very mild case of it herself. But uh, so, you know, just be in prayer. There's, there's folks being impacted, I know, right here in our area. There's also folks that are. Uh, dealing with the, you know, the illness, and some are more affected than others. So we want to we want to be in prayer for that. Do we have other prayer concerns to lift up today? Lisa Hay asks for extra prayers for the Easter Star. They have been invaded with yeah. several that have COVID. Yeah, in the nursing home. For the first time. Well, yeah. The nursing home had an outbreak of that. Yeah, that's part of the reason Lisa's not here. It's good, and, and it's this Friday, I think they're going up, isn't it? Yeah. So continue to pray for them as they deal with all of that. They've been as bad as it was. It worked out very well for all of all in all concerned, but it was tough there. Yeah. And and be in prayer for our, our local firefighters. Gosh, I heard fire trucks running out just the other day. I don't know where they went, but they were out and in the snow and the crud and. Said, well, maybe somebody called them to come shovel. I don't know. But, <laughs> that'd be better than going out to the fire. But yeah, we just we need to be in prayer for all of the folks that are doing stuff like that because it just 
it's hard it's hard to help with that and when the weather doesn't cooperate it makes it even worse all right any other prayers all right well let's uh, prepare our hearts and minds then for a time of prayer with uh, it is so sweet to trust in jesus <coughs> Gracious and loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we lift you the prayers that we've shared in the silence of our hearts, prayers that we can't speak. Maybe there are no words. Maybe we don't know how to share, but we know you hear. Thank you. Thank you for hearing our prayers, even without words. Thank you also for hearing the prayers that we list in our, in our bulletin each week, the, the people and the families that are dear to us, uh, those that are doing hard jobs and, and important jobs, Lord. We lift them all to you this day. We especially lift up Julie, who is going to be going for her surgery on Monday. We pray for a, a good surgery that it will take care of the problem, that it will, that it will bring about the, the relief from this disease that she's looking for. And we pray for her family as they surround her with love and care. We lift up a prayer also for uh, Kelly, who uh, had the surgery and then found that the cancer had spread. We pray that they'll be able to arrest that and to, uh, and to stop that. We lift up a prayer for those that are dealing with uh, the illness, the COVID virus. We especially think of the folks in, uh, in the Good Samaritan or the, the nursing home up in North Dakota. 
Cooker, not in the wrong town, in Redfield, the Eastern Star Nursing Home is, they've been impacted by COVID for the first time since this whole business began. We pray for all of the people that are there and all of the staff and, and the helpers that are there to help them through this time. Uh, Lord, be with them in the midst of this. Pray also for my friend, Pastor Rick Craig, who's uh, also dealing with uh, ravages of COVID. We pray that he will be uh, lightly impacted and that he'll be back and ready to go very, very soon with the uh, ministry and the blessing that he is to the people in his parish. We lift up prayers also, Lord, for all that deal with this disease, wherever they may be, and whether they have serious cases or mild cases, Lord, we pray for their healing. Pray for your healing hand to be upon them and upon all, even those that aren't suffering with the disease. Heal us all, Lord. Heal us. We pray also for the healing of our nation, and we lift up to you, Lord, our, our, our country. We know that no matter what happens, you're still in charge, and we, we pray that we can honor that and remember that and rest in that. So, Lord, be with us all as we go about the tasks of this day and the days that are ahead. Help us as we do all of the things that come our way to do. Help us to remember we are your chosen, dearly loved child, a part of your family, a part of a huge and wonderful family. Help us to live in and through that, Lord, and to find our blessing there and not in any other place. Let us truly and honestly know. All of this we ask and we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to share together these words when we prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Also, we uh, want to take some time before we do our final song to offer a blessing uh, over the offerings that we receive. Uh, we do uh, get offerings online now. We have that available. You can text to give or, or go to Subsplash and, and give in that way. But we do thank so much that folks that are sharing and, and supporting our church and the ministries that we have uh, as a part of this, this church. So if you could just take a moment and we'll bow for a word of prayer over our offerings. Gracious God, we thank you so much that you bless us so richly and that you give us the opportunity to share that blessing back with you so that your work can be done on this earth in places that sometimes we can't go, but our, our support can. Thank you for that opportunity, Lord, and for all the chances you give us to care for your people. Help us to do whatever we can to ease the suffering, ease the pain, and ease the sorrow in this world. We pray that in Jesus' name today. As we uh, close our time of worship together, we'll be sharing uh, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Stand with me if you're able as we sing that together.
Christ the Lord is King. We go in service of that King as we go into the world to be His family, to be His people, His children, beloved and chosen. Go and know that you are part of God's family. Amen.